some missing person cases leave us baffled or confused, while others, we have a pretty good idea of what happened. But some, well, there's so little data available, you have no idea. But what happens when you have a missing persons case where that little data is conflicting and adds more confusion? That brings us to the case of Gail Lenore Cookson. The 35-year-old would last be seen on March 1st, 1984, where already we come to our first bit of conflicting info because some sources suggest she was last seen leaving a residence while others state it was her residence. But it gets worse because sometimes she's listed as disappearing on March 1st, 1984, while other times she's cited as disappearing November 25th, 1984, eight months later. What is consistent across reports is the suspicion of foul play in her disappearance. Remarkably, the lack of information goes beyond the circumstances of her disappearance, as there is a scarcity of details about her life. Even local newspapers from the time failed to mention her. There appears to be no active search or public awareness regarding her case, making you wonder how much effort really went into finding her. Now before I continue, I have to state, I'm drawing heavily from the work of whereaboutstillunknown.wordpress.com, where the admin of the blog did a great job rounding up what little was available. One intriguing aspect of Gail's life this researcher found is revealed through CD directory listings from 1971 to 1973, where she is consistently referred to as Miseras Gail L. Cookson. However, these listings do not reference a husband, leaving room for speculation about her marital status. The absence of a husband's name could imply separation, divorce, or a situation where her husband lived elsewhere, potentially due to military service or incarceration. Further confusion comes from the presence of other Cookson's at the same address in the city directory. Yvette Cookson, as you can see here, was born in 1952 and passed away in 2007, and appears to be a relative. Despite their strong resemblance between Gail and Yvette, the age difference rules out the possibility of Yvette being Gail's daughter. And on Yvette's obituary in 2007, it mentions no relatives, only her ties to Jehovah's Witnesses. The residence also housed a Phyllis Cookson, born in 1922 and died in 2001, but her obituary mentions no children. So were these other two ladies Gail's in-laws instead? The blog then attempted to trace Gail's lineage through Ancestry.com, as well as research on Phyllis's family members, which did not help as there were no Cookson's that married a Gail, and there's no divorce record or declaration of death for her either, so we don't know if Cookson was her maiden or married name. The blog would even file a FOIA request, but they were denied access since it's technically an open case. Finally, making it even crazier, these others that live with Yvette and Phyllis can be located in the Sacramento City Directory over the decades of the 70s and 80s. Meanwhile, Gail who appears in the city directory at that residence from 1971 to 1973, completely disappears out of Sacramento's directory after that. Yet, she is not reported as missing from the city of Sacramento until 11 years later in 1984. So where was she during those 11 years? Very confusing case. Gail would be in her 70s now if she is still alive. eighteen ninety eight in the town of Gatton, Queensland Colony, in what is today Australia, a family known as the Murphys owned a farm at a location called Blackfellows Creek, about eight miles from town. It was a very small community, consisting of about four hundred and forty nine people, but it was a major stopover point between the metropolis of Brisbane and a farming region known as the Darling Downs. The Murphy family was big like a lot of families back then, consisting of ten children but our mystery revolves around only three, that of Michael, 29, his two younger sisters, Nora, 27, and Ellen, 18. Now Michael was actually out of town working on a government farm about a 40 minute drive away, while their other brother Daniel was in Brisbane working as a police constable. But since it was December 26th, Boxing Day, Michael returned home where he and his sisters Ellen and Nora would go to a dance but when they showed up around 9 p.m., they found out that it had actually been canceled, so they returned home. However, they never arrived. It would be the next morning 
when the family became worried, their mother would ask one of her son-in-laws, William McNeil, to go look for the two. Now Michael, the night before, had borrowed a sulky, which is a lightweight cart pulled by a horse, and he borrowed it from McNeil. So when he was out looking for the three, he came across the distinctive tracks that Sulky left, which was easily identifiable because of a wobbling wheel that it had. He would notice the cart went off-road and through an opening in the fence. After following it through a rough winding trail for about three quarters of a mile, he would find the three. Michael and Ellen were lying back to back within two feet of each other, while Nora lay in the same east-west orientation on a neatly spread rug to the east of the other two. Both women had their hands tied behind their backs with handkerchiefs. Forming a triangle, the sulky was facing south, about 18 feet from Michael and 36 feet from Nora. The horse had been shot in the head. The victim's legs were arranged with their feet pointing west. The signature was never repeated in Australia criminal history, and it, just like the murders, remains unexplained. Now the brother-in-law, William McNeil, would actually go to a local hotel where patrons tended to gather and told them of the murder scene first. And just as you would expect, about 40 people rushed to the scene, most likely destroying evidence in the process. After this, William would then contact a local police sergeant who rode out to the murder scene with him. They remained there for about 30 minutes, and this sergeant didn't even make one note about the crime scene, nor did he take statements or make the large group of people leave. They would then go back to town to contact the much bigger and much more professional police from Brisbane to attend the scene. However, after requesting the telegram be marked urgent, he was told that the police had no authority to send urgent telegrams, which was wrong. And this sergeant would later be criticized for not knowing that. He would also be criticized for waiting around all day, waiting around for a reply instead of going back out to the crime scene. The telegram was received at 12.52, but because it was a holiday, it wasn't opened until the next morning at 9 a.m. Meanwhile, this sergeant, William Errol, would send a magistrate and a bootmaker to look after the murder scene. I wish I was making that up. These two would also let townsfolk just walk into the scene and look around. Meanwhile, Daniel, the brother who was a police officer, would actually receive a telegram at police headquarters from a family friend informing him of the murders on the day they were discovered. And not surprisingly, he asked for three days leave to grieve, and it was granted. He intended to catch a train to head back home to Gatton, but he missed it. And three days later, when he returned to headquarters, he discovered that no action was being taken by the detectives because rumors were swirling that the whole thing was a hoax. Finally, the inspector was informed it was not a hoax, but this inspector would not inform the commissioner of Brisbane police for another five hours because the information didn't come through official channels. Finally, once the commissioner was told, he immediately ordered detectives to go to the scene. But in what was a comedy of errors, the team of detectives did not board a train at midnight in spite of the fact there was one departing, and instead waited until the next morning at 7.30 to go. It should be noted, a royal commission later slammed the police for all this. The bodies were finally moved to a hotel, where the medical officer would eventually arrive and do an autopsy. Michael had been shot and struck with a blunt instrument to the head. Ellen had her skull fractured by two blows to the head. These two were sitting upright and back to back when they were struck. Nora had also been struck to the extent her brain was protruding. She also had a harness strap around her neck tight enough to have caused her death. Both girls had been assaulted and semen was found on their clothes, along with Michael who may have also been assaulted. While the girls had also been violated with the brass mounted handle of a whip, which police could never find. William would later testify that when he seen Michael, his hands were not tied behind his back, but evidence showed that they had been tied at some point, with one hand holding an open purse. But every witness that had went to the scene stated his hands were not tied, but a breaching strap lay nearby and the empty purse was a short distance away. But when the body had been removed, the breaching strap was found between his untied hands and the empty purse was in one hand. Michael was said to have had about the equivalent of a hundred bucks that night, and it was missing. So detectives believed that one of the witnesses that came to the scene, maybe William, had untied Michael to steal the money, hence destroying some of the evidence. It only gets sloppier from here, because apparently the autopsy was nothing more than superficial, 
and no bullet in Michael was recovered. It would actually take the bodies being exhumed to recover the bullet from the skull of Michael. So as you can see, even in a time when police investigation techniques were in their infancy, this case was still majorly bungled. But an investigation did eventually begin, and everyone from traveling workers to family members were suspected. There were rumors of cover-ups and of incest within the Murphy family, which were never confirmed. One suggested that the father, upon discovering the incestuous relationships between his children, went crazy and killed all three of them, while some accused the father of having relations with his daughters. However, this was just journalism gone bad, because detectives never seriously considered these allegations. However, it did hurt the family deeply, and they chose not to cooperate with police, except for the brother Daniel, who was a police officer. There was also early suspicion on William McNeil, who had a lot of questionable actions, as well as not getting along with his in-laws. His account was inconsistent, and he would later get in trouble for burning down his own family business for insurance, as well as trying to make himself out as a hero to the press. In spite of all the evidence that this had most likely been committed by more than one person, and most likely a gang, police focused in on one suspect, Theo Farmer. He was a butcher in town, and lived in a hut just 900 feet from the murder scene. He had been seen by a number of people walking along the road the night of the murders as well, while one witness was even claiming they seen him washing blood from a pullover days later, while another police officer gave evidence that a suspected farmer had been involved in the murder of a 15-year-old boy named Alfred Hill, and again, his body had been left with his feet pointing west, which took place in Oxley about an hour away, and had taken place just a few weeks previously, as the same gun was suspected of being used in both crimes, and it was found near the butchery where Theo worked. Theo would be questioned and almost immediately joined the army afterwards, where he deserted later. The next year, he was found under an alias where he was admitted to a hospital suffering from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He died in 1900, and the government hid that until 1918. He left a suicide note stating he was present during the murders and he couldn't sleep due to the nightmares seeing the victim's heads bashed in. But was he really the killer or did he just witness it? No one knows. Over a century later, in 2013, another suspect and theory emerged, that of a man named Joe Quinn, a transient with a history of criminal aliases and run-ins with the law. He allegedly harbored a grudge against Michael because he had exposed Quinn's criminal past during an altercation at a barber shop at a time during a strike where Quinn held influence under one of his aliases. This theory goes on to state that four years after the strikes, Quinn returned and linked up with some local thugs who helped orchestrate their murders. Hell Boggs is a name you have probably heard mentioned before. He was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from New Orleans, and he served as House Majority Leader as well as a member of the Warren Commission. But it's what happened on October 16, 1972, that would forever link his name with mystery. As Majority Leader, he often campaigned for others, including the representative of Alaska, Nick Baggage. And it's on this day that Boggs would get aboard a twin-engine Cessna 310 with Representative Baggage who was in a tight race in the general election, and head towards a fundraiser. When sometime during the flight from Anchorage to Juneau, the plane would vanish, taking Boggs, Baggage, Baggage's aide Russell Brown, and the pilot Don Johns with it. The search would obviously be one of the biggest in U.S. history, which included the U.S. Coast Guard, Navy, Army, Air Force, Civil Air Patrol, and civilian winged aircraft and helicopters. The Cessna was required to carry an emergency locator transmitter per law. Yet strangely, no emergency transmission signal determined to be coming from the plane was ever heard during the search. However, the National Transportation Safety Board, in its report on the incident, stated that a pilot's portable emergency transmitter is permissible instead of a transmitter on the plane. But Don, the pilot, his portable transmitter was found in an aircraft back in Fairbanks. The NTSB also found a witness who's seen an unidentified object in the pilot's briefcase that resembled the portable emergency transmitter 
except that it wasn't the right color. Taking this info, the NTSB would state that neither the pilot nor aircraft had an emergency location transmitter. The search was eventually called off after 39 days when not one sign of the wreckage was found, and to this day, it still hasn't been found. Interestingly, the Washington-based newspaper, Roll Call, which reports on Capitol Hill, would find information through FOIA request that two FBI telexes, which is kind of like a fax machine, had came into the office in LA, indicating that someone had contacted the FBI and said they had knowledge of the whereabouts of the plane, and the two people were still living at the site, and then they gave the coordinates. This was followed up on two days later, in which the FBI actually stated they verified the authenticity of the source and established their credibility. This source was stated to be someone working in surveillance technologies for an undisclosed firm and they had located the plane. The Coast Guard would even search these areas given by the source but found nothing and the FBI finally deemed the source unreliable. And here's where a lot of the conspiracies come in because Boggs was actually taken to the airport that day by a young politician named Bill Clinton, who later appointed Boggs' wife as an ambassador to the Vatican after she served 18 years in Congress. And of course, there's also conspiracies tied to the fact that Boggs served on the Warren Commission, which some conspiracy theorists cite that Boggs wasn't happy with the commission's findings and was pushing for the investigation to be reopened at the time of his death, although his daughter disputed this in 2004, stating he had no problems whatsoever with their findings. Of course, the early official theory was the plane just crashed after flying into violent weather, but it was hard to believe that not one piece of wreckage was ever found, as well as the issue with some mysterious radio transmissions the FBI was said to have found. Two decades later, in 1995, a mobster would tell authorities that the plane had been bombed, and there is some weird facts to sort of back this, like Representative Baggage's widow, Peggy, 14 months after he was declared dead in 1974, she married a man in Arizona named Jerry Pasley, a mafia associate that was eventually linked to five murders and three bombings, including a blast at the home of a retired Supreme Court Justice, Evo D. Consina. Many mob figures attended their wedding, and surprisingly, an organized crime investigator for Arizona also attended and took notes. Pasley was even in Alaska a year after the plane disappeared, as he was there involved in the drug trade, which is when he met the widow Peggy. Of course, these are all conspiracies, and the most likely scenario is some kind of catastrophe happened in the air and the plane was lost in the sea, or it crashed into the dense evergreen forest and rugged terrain of Alaska, where a ton of air accidents and disappearances already occur. June 17, 1959, Dukes Meadows, Chiswick, London. Police officers were on a routine patrol of the north bank of the River Thames, as the park had a reputation as a lover's lane, and sex workers were known to take their clients there. But tonight, police would find something way more serious than two lovers looking for privacy, because they would come across a body near the river about 200 yards west of a bridge. The victim, a woman, had her dress torn at the waist and opened to reveal her breast, along with marks around her neck consistent with strangulation. Her underwear and shoes were also missing and no ID or personal possessions were found. An autopsy found that she had died between three to five hours earlier. A post-mortem photograph was distributed by the press and she eventually was identified by her roommate and her mother as 21-year-old Elizabeth Figg. Extensive searches were carried out to find her clothing as well as a handbag, including in the riverbed, but nothing was ever found. The official theory was that a client was responsible for her demise, which took place in the car, and she was later dumped at this position, while her clothing and handbag remained in the car. A witness did come forward and stayed on the night he and his wife had seen a car's headlights parked in the area at 12.05 a.m. Shortly after the lights were switched off, they heard a woman scream. This crime would go unsolved. And that would be one thing if that was just it, the whole mystery, but we're just getting started. Because four years later, on November 8th, 1963, 22-year-old Gwyneth Reese would be found by workmen 
at a trash dump. She was naked except for one stocking and her cause of death was unknown. Then we move forward three months later on February 2nd, 1964, when 30 year old Hannah Telford was found west of Hammersmith Bridge. She had been strangled and several of her teeth were missing and her underwear was stuffed into her mouth. Two months later, on April 8th, 1964, not far from where Telford had been found, 25 year old Irene Lockwood would also be found. She had been drowned and she was pregnant at the time. Amazingly, detectives just now came to the conclusion that a serial killer was responsible. Two weeks later, on April 24th, 22 year old Helen Bartellome was found in an alleyway, death by strangulation. Her death gave investigators their first piece of evidence, flecks of paint used in car manufacturing, possibly coming from the killer's workplace. Three months later, on July 14th, 30 year old Mary Fleming was found strangled. Again, paint specks were found on the body and neighbors also reported hearing a car reversing down the street just before the body was discovered. Then November 25th, four months later, 21 year old Francis Brown was found strangled. But this time, a witness had a good description because Francis had actually vanished a month before being found and her colleague had actually seen who she was getting into the car with. This witness was able to give a good enough description to lead to a sketch. She also thought he had been driving a Ford Zephyr. Finally, two months later, 27 year old Bridget O'Hara was found strangled near a storage shed. Once again, the body turned up flecks of industrial paint, which are traced to an electrical transformer near where she was discovered. These last six killings would become known as the Hammersmith Nude Murders, attributed to a man named Jack the Stripper. The first two of Fig and Reese are believed to be connected, but unconfirmed. Scotland Yard would interview almost 7,000 suspects, and in the spring of 1965, a major breakthrough occurred. A sample of paint that perfectly matched that recovered from several victims was found beneath a concealed transformer at the rear of the building on the Heron Factory estate. This factory faced a paint spraying shop. After this lead, detectives falsely announced that the suspect pool had reached 20 men and then these suspects were all eliminated. Then he announced there were 10 suspects and finally three, but there was never an arrest and there were no other known Jack the Stripper killings after this news conference, indicating the suspect may have gotten scared. As far as the theories go, well, there's some crazy speculation there as well. Some have tried to link the third and seventh victims, Hannah Telford and Francis Brown, to the Profumo Affair, a major scandal in British politics the same Secretary of State for War, 46-year-old John Profumo, had an affair with 19-year-old Christine Killer. This only got worse when it was discovered that Christine was most likely simultaneously having an affair with Soviet spy Yevgeny Ivanov. This was now a national security risk and big news. This led to all kinds of other rumors of other sex scandals, which I guess included these two victims. Making things more confusing, but some of the victims were known to engage in the underground party scene as well as appearing in pornographic films and some have theorized that these victims all knew each other and the suspect knew them through this underground party scene. As far as names go, the chief inspector in charge of the case had a favorite suspect named Mungo Ireland whom he first identified in a 1970 interview. He was a respectable married man in his 40s and worked as a security guard and that security gig was at the Heron Trading Estate where the paint flecks had been traced to. He first became a suspect right after the last murder, which would explain why they stopped, because after he was identified, he committed suicide. However, years later, his case for being a suspect was weakened when it was found that he had been in Scotland when the last murder occurred, although Scotland Yard believed it was possible those records were falsified to make it look like he was in Scotland. Unfortunately, after his suicide, the task force disbanded. Then after this is where we get the more out there suspects. In 2001, reformed gangster Jimmy Tippett Jr. would claim that British light heavyweight boxing champion Freddie Mills was responsible. Apparently, many gangsters from that time period had long suspected him and this wasn't just a way to garner attention for Tippett's book because as far back as 1972, a freelance journalist 
would receive information from a chief inspector that Mills was responsible, he too would commit suicide shortly after the last murder, but years later, it was pretty much confirmed he was never a real suspect. In 2006, another theory was proposed that stated that the man responsible was a detective for the London Metro Police and that several senior detectives were sure it was him. Apparently, this had also been brought up as early as 1972. Finally, is a man named Harold Jones, who at the age of 15, killed two young girls in 1921. He was released after 20 years for good behavior. The stripper murderers had similar features to the two he was convicted for. He died of cancer a few years after the last murder as well, and was theorized he stopped because he was too sick to do it anymore. But due to the poor record keeping in the mid 20th century, he was never connected by investigators. November 29, 1970. A man and his two young daughters were taking a hike in the foothills of Oricon, Norway, at an area called Istalen, or the Ice Valley, also nicknamed the Death Valley, due to the area's history of suicides in the Middle Ages, as well as a recent string of accidents. But as they walked along, they would start to notice an unusual burning smell. One of the young girls would then spot the charred body of a woman on the ground. Shocked, the three ran back to get police. Detectives soon made it to the woman's severely burned body, which they found in a supine position. Coupled with the absence of a campfire nearby, raised immediate questions about the circumstances leading to her death. The burned state of her body and clothes, along with the removal of identifying marks from various items near the body, made the whole thing even more eerie. The belongings found near the woman included an empty bottle of liquor, two plastic water bottles, a passport holder, clothing, accessories, and a matchbox. The intentional removal or rubbing off of identifying marks on these items suggests a deliberate effort to conceal her identity. The presence of burned paper and a fur hat with traces of gas beneath the body made detectives suspect foul play. Soon after this, two suitcases at Bergen Railway Station were found, which contained various items including money, clothing, wigs, makeup, and maps, and was linked to her through a partial fingerprint. And again, there was the deliberate removal of all the identification information from these items, which made it impossible to identify her. Also discovered was 500 Deutsche Mark notes, which made the investigators wonder about her motives, or if she possibly had connections to some kind of network like a criminal, or maybe even foreign government. The autopsy results indicated the cause of death as a combination of taking around 60 sleeping pills and carbon monoxide poisoning. The investigation further revealed a series of false identities and aliases the woman had been using during her travels across Norway and Europe. She always changed up slight details like the name and birthday, but always kept a place of birth as Belgium. They also decoded notepad entries that determined the indicated dates and places she had visited. Detectives also found she had a habit of changing hotel rooms almost immediately after getting into the room, as she also told hotel employees that she was a traveling saleswoman and antiquities dealer. The composite sketches circulated through Interpol failed to lead to her identification, and despite significant police efforts, the case was closed without finding her identity. And although the official theory was suicide, this has been hotly contested, as many believe she was murdered. Even though the investigation went cold fairly quick after it began, the mystery has endured and people have came forward over the decades with more tips. One significant one came from a taxi driver in 1991, who anonymously disclosed that another man had joined the unknown woman on the ride from the hotel to the Bergen railway station. This of course led to much speculation about who this man was and what exactly his connection was with her, or if he had anything to do with her death. In 2005, a Bergen resident came forward with a possible sighting of the woman five days before her body was discovered. The witness described an unusual encounter on a hillside where the woman, seemingly dressed for the city rather than a hike, walked ahead of two men. He had apparently went to someone he knew at the police to report this, but he was told to forget about it. Forensic advancements, such as stable isotope analysis of the woman's teeth, have provided additional clues about her origins. The results suggested a likely birthplace in southern Germany or on the French-German border region. 
With a childhood move to France, the woman's education in France or a neighboring country was also inferred from handwriting analysis. Other testing also revealed a matrilineal line of descent originating in Southeast Europe or Southwest Asia. But who was this woman really and what exactly was she up to? The main theory has always been she was a spy. This was at the height of the Cold War and it could explain the multiple fake identities and all the travel, as well as the coded notebook. And Norway at the time did have some strange disappearances close to military installations that trace back to international espionage. Declassified records of the Norwegian Armed Forces also revealed that many of the woman's movements seemed to correspond to a top secret missile program. One fisherman even reported seeing her in the area where it was being tested, as well as a shoe salesman who sold her a pair of rubber boots in that area. Others believe, however, she may have been involved in criminal activity, possibly working with a criminal organization as a courier, moving stolen art and antiquities across the continent, while another theory stated she might have been a sex worker based on her planned routes and various aliases, peculiar behavior at hotels, and interactions with different men who never came forward. A 2019 resident of the town of Forbach, France, claimed to have had a relationship with the Estal woman in the summer of 1970. The informant said she spoke several languages with a Balkan accent with a lisp. She also was reluctant to share personal details and dressed up to look younger than her age, which he believed to be 26. He also stated she often received scheduled phone calls from abroad. He found various wigs and colorful clothes in her belongings, as well as a photograph of herself riding a horse. He had considered contacting authorities years ago, but was too afraid to do so. After this, the theories are seen as less likely, but I'll gloss over a few of them. There's one that states that she was a Mossad agent, which cites the police department shutting down their investigation after only three weeks as part of a cover-up or higher authorities blocking a more thorough investigation. And then you have the flip side of that theory, the state that she was actually working for the Palestinians and was killed by a Mossad agent. Finally, it's thought she may have just suffered from mental illness. February 7th, 1906, Jean Van Kalk was living with her grandparents in Brussels, Belgium. The eight-year-old would go visit her mother every evening for about an hour or two. Her father had abandoned the family long ago and never even knew his daughter, although I'm unsure why she was not living with her mother. But usually when she went over, her grandfather accompanied her. This was her first evening she would go alone, as her grandfather was working, and around 6.30 that evening, she would leave as usual. However, she never arrived at her mother's home. Around 11.45 that night, a machinist, Joseph Eilenbosch, and his son would find a suspicious package outside a home in the area and would notify a policeman who went to inspect it. He was joined by another officer who would help him carry the package back to the police department. Once there, the police chief inspected the package and asked the officers to open it. The first thing they would spot was a blue pea coat and a checkered dress, and looking closer, they realized it had frozen blood on it. Then, all of a sudden, the still warm corpse of the little girl fell to the ground. She had been dismembered and wrapped in thick paper tied with a hemp cord. Her legs had been amputated and were not in the box. Messengers were sent to awaken the commissioner and the public prosecutor, and the press was also informed. Two men would later arrive, I assume one of these was her grandfather, and they reported to the police that she was missing. The clothes in the box were then identified as belonging to her. The coroner would start his exam, and he quickly determined that she had been dismembered by someone with specialist knowledge, probably a doctor or a butcher, but she had died of suffocation from violent vomiting after being forced to drink a large quantity of alcohol, and she had also been violently assaulted. She had passed somewhere between eight and nine, only an hour and a half after she left. The people in town were super upset to say the least. Police began searching for the killer while also dragging canals in hopes of finding her legs. 10 days later on the 16th, a gardener would find two packages about 16 inches long on a farm. This would be her legs. The day before, her boots were found close by. The government offered 20,000 Belgian francs for anyone who could identify the murderer and even offered leniency to the person if he turned himself in. This is another one that the police were heavily criticized 
for their investigation. Originally at the scene was a police dog and her handler who stopped where the box had been dropped off. The dog then went to a neighbor's house before going back to her grandparents where she barked for a long time. Later, a Spaniard and Algerian were taken into custody and were quickly released. Then, a butcher's apprentice, who was also a beggar, was taken in and released. Finally, a local doctor was also considered a person of interest, but was never arrested. A lawyer would then gain access to the police files and listed 29 failures by the police department, including leads that were never followed up on because they came from a little girl. This girl had reported seeing Sean near her grandparents' house accompanied by a man she seemed to trust but heading in the opposite direction of her mother's home. Unfortunately, there's not a lot on this one. No theories, as police never even had a good person of interest. July 1979, 34-year-old Sue Sharp and her five children, 15-year-old John, 14-year-old Sheila, 12-year-old Tina, 10-year-old Rick, and 5-year-old Greg, would leave their home in Connecticut after a separation with her abusive husband. The family would put roots down in Northern California where Sue's brother lived. She rented a small trailer at first before finally moving the next fall to the rural town of Keddie. And on the morning of April 11th, 1981, Sue, Sheila, and Greg would leave the residence of their friends, the Meeks, to pick up Rick, who was at a baseball tryout. On the way, they would pass 15-year-old John hitchhiking with his friend, 15-year-old Dana Wingate. She would pick them up and drive them the rest of the way to Keddie. A few hours later, John and Dana went back out and hitchhiked back to Quincy, about six miles away, where they may have intended to visit friends. That evening, Sheila, the 14-year-old, left around 8 p.m. to spend the night next door with the Seaboat family, while Sue would stay home with Rick, Greg, and the boy's young friend, Justin Smart. Tina, the 12-year-old, who had also been at the Seaboat residence, would return back at 9.30. The next morning, around 8 a.m., Sheila would return back home to find a horrible scene. There lay Sue, John, and Dana in the living room. All three had been bound with medical tape and electrical cords. Tina was missing as well, while Rick, Greg, and Justin were all unharmed in the adjacent room. The initial report stated they all slept through it, but this was later contradicted. Sheila rushed back to the Seaboat's house, who would then come over and retrieve the boys through the window, which he, Jamie Seaboat, admitted briefly entering the home through the back door to see if anyone was alive, thus contaminating the crime scene. The murders themselves were pretty brutal. There were two bloody knives and one hammer left at the scene, and one knife had been bent roughly 30 degrees. Sue was on her side near the living room, nude from the waist down, and gagged with a blue bandana and her own underwear, which had been secured with tape. She had also been stabbed in the chest and her throat stabbed down to her spine. John's throat had also been slashed and Dana had multiple head injuries and had been manually strangled to death. Both had suffered trauma to their heads by the hammers, but John and Sue died from knife wounds, whereas Dana died from asphyxiation. And we haven't even touched the other issue yet. Where was 12-year-old Tina? That would not be answered for a while. Meanwhile at the crime scene, police would start their investigation which would be heavily criticized later on. Sheila and the Seaboat family, who were in close proximity, reported hearing no commotion during the night, while a couple in nearby house, 16, was awakened at 1.15 a.m. by what sounded like muffled screaming. The missing items from the house included Tina's jacket, shoes, and a toolbox with various tools, which made it seem like a deliberate act rather than a random home intrusion. Shockingly, there was no indication of forced entry leaving investigators to consider the possibility of someone familiar with the residence. The home's telephone was also taken off the hook. The cord cut and the drapes closed indicated it was all pre-planned. Martin Smart would be identified as the main suspect, as well as being the father of Justin Smart, who spent the night with the Sharps. He reported a missing claw hammer taken from his home. The sheriff at the time, Sylvester Thomas, despite acknowledging Martin's supply of endless clues, suggested that these clues were to divert suspicion away from him, which I'll come back to that in a second. Finally, there was a green van seen at the Sharps' home by several witnesses. Although the other boys had slept through the murders, Justin Smart would give conflicting accounts. He first claimed of having dreamed details of the murders, but later stated 
he witnessed them. Under hypnosis, Justin described witnessing Sue with two men in the living room, one with a mustache, the other clean shaven with long hair. Both wore glasses. These two would have a confrontation with John and Dana. Tina then entered the room and was taken out the cabin's back door by one of these men. I also have to point out here that this wasn't a trained hypnotist working with Justin. Instead, it was the sheriff who was administering it after taking a class on hypnotism, which is just one of the dumb early decisions the sheriff's department would make. Because sketches would be made based on Justin's descriptions, and instead of using a professional forensic sketch artist from the Justice Department and FBI, which was on standby, the sheriff would instead choose a local man who had no artistic ability or training in forensic sketching whatsoever. And for what reason, that was never answered, other than the guy had helped them a couple of times in the past. They were described as being in their late 20s to early 30s. One was 5'11 to 6'2 with dark blonde hair. The other was 5'6 to 5'10 with greasy black hair. Both wore golden frame sunglasses. Rumors soon began regarding ritualistic or drug-related motives, which the sheriff stated they would focus on evidence rather than speculation. Over 4,000 man-hours were spent on the case, yet no arrests were made. Now back to Tina. Shortly after her disappearance, the FBI was investigating it as a possible abduction, although they would back off a couple weeks later, stating the California State Department of Justice was doing an adequate job, making the FBI's presence unnecessary. The local authorities did search a five-mile radius around the house with canines, but nothing came up. It would actually be a little over four years later when a bottle collector would find part of a human skull and mandible at a campsite near Feather Falls about 100 miles away. These remains would be linked to Tina. Here they also found her blue nylon jacket, a blanket, a pair of jeans with a missing back pocket, and empty medical tape dispenser. Strangely, after announcing the discovery, the sheriff's office would receive an anonymous call identifying the remains as belonging to Tina. However, that call was not documented, but in 2013, the tape containing the call was found in an evidence box. This is one of those the police dropped the ball on, and many things have come out over the years showing who the most likely guilty party was. In 2008, a documentary featuring Marilyn Smart, the widow of Martin Smart, stated she believed her husband Martin and his friend, John Bubaday, were responsible. She claimed the evening of, she had left the two at the bar at 11 p.m. to return home to sleep. She woke up at 2 a.m. to find the two men burning an unknown item in the wood stove. She also stated that Martin hated Johnny with a passion. However, in this same documentary, the sheriff stated that he had interviewed Martin and he passed the polygraph. But in 2016, it was divulged that shortly after the murders, Martin left Ketty and drove to Reno. While there, he would send a letter to Marilyn about the struggles of their marriage, and he wrote, I've paid the price of your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. The special investigator assigned to the case in 2016, when this came out, stated that the letter had been overlooked in the original investigation and never admitted as evidence. He would also later criticize the detectives and the sheriff from the original investigation, while the current sheriff would acknowledge the original investigators may have participated in a cover-up. It was also revealed that a counselor, whom Martin regularly visited, stated he had murdered Sue and Tina, but claimed he didn't do anything to the boys, insinuating that was done by his friend, John, who supposedly had ties to organized crime. He would state that Tina was only killed to prevent her from identifying him. This counselor, who worked for the Veterans Affairs, did report Martin's confession to the sheriff's office, but it was blown off as hearsay. But more evidence emerged in 2016, as the hammer matching the description of the one Martin claimed to have lost was found in a local pond. The sheriff stated it had been placed there intentionally. He would also state the six suspects were also now being examined. Two years later, he would follow this up by stating that DNA had been recovered from a piece of tape at the crime scene and that it matched a known still living suspect, which is a bit odd because the two prime suspects were Martin Smart, who died in 2000, and John Bubaday, who died in 1988. So who does this DNA belong to? Furthermore, who could the six suspects be? And why in the world was this family so brutally killed? A lot of this is still left up for conjecture, but we'll start with the DNA that was found on the tape at the crime scene. The sheriff said this suspect was still alive, yet this person was never arrested. 
but online conjecture seems to believe that that person was Marilyn Smart, the wife of Martin, and the widow who would state in the documentary that Martin was responsible. However, in 2020, Marilyn died just two years after the DNA news. Others have speculated too though that that DNA might have belonged to their son, Justin, who was spending the night with the Sharps, although it's believed he was not a willing participant, but forced by his parents to get involved. Now for the motive, this is also heavily disputed. Some claim Sue was the true target and the others end up being silenced because they were witnesses and that Martin killed her because Sue was canceling Marilyn about leaving Martin because he was abusive and unfaithful, as Sue herself had came from an abusive relationship. However, others believe that Martin and Sue were involved in an affair and that somehow this led to the murder. Regardless of either scenario, Marilyn moved out of the house the same day the murders occurred. Finally, some theorize that Sue was not the target at all and that it was Tina. Eleven AM, June fifth, nineteen sixty. A carpenter in Espo, Finland, was walking along the shore of Lake Bodum when he would come across a grisly sight. Here, at a campsite, lay four teenagers who had been viciously attacked. The carpenter would rush to alert authorities. When they arrived, they discovered three of the teens were already deceased, that of Mayla Borkland and Anya Mackey, who were both 15 years old, and their boyfriends, Seppo Boisman and Niels Gustafsson both 18, Niels being the only one who survived, but he had received a concussion, fractured jaw, and several broken facial bones. He would tell detectives later that he only caught a glimpse of the attacker and said that he was clothed in black and had bright red eyes that was coming for them, and this occurred sometime between 4 and 6 a.m. Detectives would canvass the area for witnesses and did come across a group of boys who had been bird watching from some distance away around 6 a.m. They claimed to have seen the tent collapse and a blonde man walking away from the site. The murders were also unusual in the sense that the killer did not attack the victims from within the tent. Instead, he stood outside and attacked them from outside the tent with a knife and possibly a rock. The murder weapons were never located. Even more confusing were the items the suspect stole, which included the keys to the motorcycles, yet he left the motorcycles alone while Neil's shoes had been partially hidden about 1,600 feet away from the murder site. The police did make a couple of big mistakes here, as they did not tape off the site, nor did they record any of the details of the scene. And almost immediately after, officers and other people began to trample all around the crime scene and destroy evidence. This became even worse when they called in soldiers to help search around the lake for several missing items, many of which were never found. Neil's girlfriend, Mela was found nude from the waist down and lying on top of the tent, and she had suffered the most injuries, stabbed multiple times after she died. Niels was also found on top of the tent. The case was never solved, obviously, but there were a bunch of suspects over the years. But we'll look at a couple of the major ones. Maybe the one talked about the most is a man named Valdemir Gilstrom. He was known in the area to be hostile towards campers. People stated he cut down tents threw rocks at people coming down the street, would get violent, had fired shots at some people, hid razor blades and apples, and some even said they seen him coming back from the murder scene but were too afraid to tell police. Investigators would also hear rumors that he had confessed to some people that he was the one behind it, but police blew it off because they believed he was mentally ill. He would drown in the lake nine years later, most likely by suicide. Another man, one in which the general public tend to believe, was that of Hans Esman, who lived several miles away from the lake, but was linked by a series of popular books which brought up the theory that he was the suspect. He was also rumored to be a former KGB agent, as well as he told people he had been a soldier with the SS in World War II. He was a suspect in five other murder cases and even confessed to one of those on his deathbed. Most importantly, he had went to the Helensky Hospital the day after the attack with his fingernails black from dirt and his clothes covered in red stains. The hospital staff said he was nervous and aggressive, but other than brief questioning, police never pursued him, and that may be because, according to police, he was never considered a suspect because he had an alibi on the night of the murder. Initially, authorities were looking for a man 
who had been seen in the vicinity, carrying a bag containing the victim's belongings. He was said to be walking with a bicycle and had a black beard. He was also seen walking out of the woods wearing a bloody shirt. This was Polly Luoma, a labor camp escapee and a good suspect at first, but he also had an alibi. Another was Pinti Sonanen, who was known to be violent and told a fellow inmate he was responsible, but considering he was 14 at the time of the murders, it was doubtful. However, the most interesting suspect would pop up in 2004, when 44 years after the events, Niels Gustafsson, who wasn't even publicly known as a suspect, was arrested. The Finnish authorities declared the case was solved on new forensic analysis. According to the prosecution, the bloodstains showed that Niels had been drunk and excluded out of the tent when he attacked Seppo. This led to a fight where Niels got the fractured bones in his face, which escalated to him killing the other three. However, the defense claimed there was no way Niels could have killed three people given the extent of his injuries, but had always known that the shoe prints had been left behind by the killer, and these were the same shoes that were taken away from camp and hidden, and those shoes, of course, belonged to Niels, and he was found barefoot on top of the tent. Then, there's also the fact that only the other three's blood were found on the shoes, not Niels. So the prosecution contended that his injuries occurred at a different time of the attack than the other victims, and that the only explanation was that Niels had committed the murders, faked the theft of the items by hiding them, injured himself some more, and then going back barefoot, pretending to be unconscious, and that the bird watchers who spotted the tall blonde man was really Niels. Not only that, but it was said he had been heard making an incriminating remark in the past, as well as boasting to a woman previously about his guilt. However, Niels was acquitted due to inconclusive evidence, as well as not having a good enough motive, and there's some sources that even say that DNA was found on a towel that had been sliced with a knife that came from a fifth person. Finland would actually pay Niels for the mental suffering he went through, but before I close the book on this one, there's one other weird part about this whole mystery, and it comes from a funeral photograph from one of the victims. See, Niels would be put under hypnosis at one point and asked to give as many details of the events as possible. He also described what the attacker looked like, saying he was between 20 to 30 with distinctive features like long blonde hair, a checkered shirt with black buttons buttoned up, a sweater that had several colors including black and green. A sketch artist composed this based on Neil's description. Now, if we pull up the aforementioned funeral photograph, you'll notice it looks pretty dang close. A lot of people claim this was Hans Esman. Early May 2014, 88-year-old Russell Dermond and his wife, Shirley, 87, were scheduled to attend a Kentucky Derby party at their neighbors on the weekend of May 3rd. However, the two never arrived. The neighbors did grow concerned, but did not react right away, instead waiting to hear from them. But two days later on the 6th, one of them would finally decide to walk over to their home to check and make sure they were okay. When getting there, he found the door unlocked which was odd, and he walked into the home, but nothing could have prepared him for what he would find in the garage. There lie Russell's body, and he had been decapitated. Of course, the neighbor freaked out, ran out, and called the police, who came and roped off the scene. They expected to find Shirley somewhere in the home, suffering the same fate. However, she was nowhere to be found. They started to believe she had been kidnapped, and 10 days later, she would eventually be found by fishermen at Lake Okanee, weighed down with cinder blocks, she had died from either stab wounds or a blunt object to the head. Detectives started tracing their whereabouts leading up to the crime, and they found that the last time Russell was seen was on May 1st, two days before the Kentucky Derby party they were set to attend. He had been out running errands, and then sometime later that day, him and Shirley would contact their son on the phone. After that, this was the last known contact. They also found no signs of forced entry or even a struggle in the home. It was also odd that even though the Dermans lived in a gated community with security officers and surveillance cameras, these suspects basically got in undetected, and it's unsure if they came in by vehicle or boat. Although, the sheriff did confirm that the security at the gated community was relaxed at the time. The sheriff also noted there were at least two other crime scenes, and maybe three, 
so it's unsure where the murders really occurred, which leads us to one early theory that Shirley was kidnapped and taken somewhere else to hold for a ransom before everything went bad, or that some kind of argument started somewhere else and the two were killed and brought back. The crime scene had also showed meticulous efforts to conceal the murders, such as placing towels next to Russell's body so blood wouldn't seep under the garage door and out into the driveway and alert neighbors. The murders were curious to say the least. Detectives had multiple leads to start off, but none of these went anywhere, and leads in general eventually stopped coming in. And almost a decade later, police have no persons of interest and no known motive, although the sheriff believes there was more than one person involved and they went into the home to stage a robbery. But it is baffling that nothing from the home was stolen. Even stranger, Russell's head was never even recovered, which police believe the only reason he was decapitated was so law enforcement could not recover a bullet. They cite this because of the gunshot residue found on Russell's collar. The sheriff, Howard Seals, has followed leads all over the country and brought in the FBI who provided a behavioral profile of the killers as well as reaching out to Scotland Yard for advice, but it still hasn't helped. Although, in one strange aspect, even though he's reached out to all these places, he has not brought in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. As far as suspect speculation, there's not a lot. Some people thought one of the children could be involved, but they've all been ruled out. There was also the thought that someone targeted the parents to get at one of the kids. Others point to organized crime, but this seems far-fetched while others think the killer mistakenly targeted the wrong couple. But in May 2023, the sheriff did take boxes of evidence to Othram Labs for forensic genetic genealogy testing, and he stated they got a hit. So hopefully, this case gets some traction this year. Eighteen seventy-two, near Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire, businessman. Seneca Ladd hired some workers to start digging hoes for fence posts when one of them would unearth the odd-looking clump of dirt. Upon breaking the dirt apart, the men would find this odd stone, which is about 4 inches long, 2.5 inches thick, and weighing about 1.2 pounds. It's dark and egg-shaped, and has a variety of carved symbols, some of which, on one side, show an ear of corn and several other figures. The other side is more abstract, showing inverted arrows, a moon shape, some dots, and a spiral. While suspiciously, a hole at the top goes through the stone and comes out the bottom. I say suspiciously because the holes look like they were bored out by different sized bits, but more on that in a minute. The stone is a mystery because its age, purpose, and origin are unknown. Although, it was originally believed to be a Native American relic, that's never been proven. There have been other stones with a similar shape, often called stone eggs, found throughout the world. But this one was the first ever found in America, which has led many to speculate that it could be an out-of-place artifact, maybe of Celtic, Inuit, Aztec, or even Polynesian origins. After Seneca Ladd died in 1892, he gave the stone to his daughter, and in 1927, she would donate it to the New Hampshire Historical Society, where it can be seen on exhibit at the Museum of New Hampshire History today. So, what is it? Well, one theory suggests that the stone was created by two Native American tribes to commemorate a treaty between themselves. In this theory, the hoes allowed it to rest on a stake that marked a line between territories. It would also explain the carvings on the side. Another theory is that it was a thunderstone, which myth said was stones that fell from the sky during thunderstorms and were buried in the earth, which farmers then found. But the reality was these stones are more than likely a prehistoric tool or fossil, and upon finding them, they were often used as an amulet to protect a person or building, which could explain the hole that was bored into it. Speaking of the hole, a borescope analysis, which I had never heard of, was made on the stone in 1994, and the archaeologists found that the holes had the appearance of being drilled by power tools from the 19th or 20th century. He noted that in comparing it to holes bored in stone by the natives, which had a certain amount of unevenness, the hoe in the Lake Winnipesaukee stone was extremely regular throughout. Basically, it was too good to have been done centuries ago. It was also found that several scratches in the lower bore suggested that it was placed on a metal shaft and removed several times, which leads to the theory 
that the whole thing was a hoax created by someone in the 1800s. However, others contradict this and point out that it's very possible the stone was crafted hundreds of years ago only to be found by someone in the 1800s who then drilled a hole through it and used it as an amulet or maybe the archaeologist is wrong altogether and the holes were created when the stone was and maybe it was set down on a long stick and was then used as a tool and if it wasn't a tool it could have been a device as a way to keep records of a tribe's history. As far as the more wild theories go, some suggest that the rock was some sort of magnetized navigation device, perhaps a thousand years old, or that it was made by aliens, cause why not? July 31st, 1992, Lisbon, Portugal. 22-year-old Maria Valentina, nicknamed Tina, would be found in a large cabin lying in a pool of her own blood. When members of the judicial police arrived to the scene, they were shocked at the brutality. She had been strangled, disemboweled, and some of her internal organs had been removed. The medical examiner would comment that he had never seen such a thing in over 40,000 autopsies. Investigators would begin to take a look at Tina's background and believed she was a sex worker and drug addict. Throughout the rest of the year, Investigators would receive several calls and anonymous letters about her murder, but all of these tips were duds. But this would just be the beginning of a reign of terror by a man known simply as the Lisbon Ripper. Because about a half a year later, on January 27th, a 24-year-old woman named Maria Fernanda would be found in another cabin, this time by railway workers working at a nearby bridge. Again, she had been disemboweled, but this time Almost all of the organs were removed along with her breast. And just like the first victim, this Maria was a sex worker and a drug addict as well. Now the police had six men working around the clock on this case, even sometimes getting help from the drug trafficking division, which loaned officers from its nighttime shift. It's here that detectives would find a few clues and even find a few persons of interest, but nothing anywhere near being enough to arrest someone. Heck, they didn't even have enough to bring someone in for questioning, and it was super frustrating because detectives were working under the assumption he would strike again soon, and they were right. Because two months later, 27-year-old Maria Joao was found near the location of the first victim, Maria Valentina, who was her friend. She had been mutilated in the same way as the other two, but this time, all of the organs were removed. And again, she was a sex worker. In total, there was three young brunettes, all named Maria, who were allegedly sex workers and drug addicts, who had been disemboweled with an object that was not a knife, but possibly a scalpel. But at every crime scene, there was no blood other than the victims, no hair, no footprints, no fingerprints, or glove material. Although the investigators had some people that they were interested in, they had absolutely nothing that would stick. They come up with a profile that stated that the Ripper was probably a solitary man and did not know his victims, and his crimes could be considered perfect. He probably knocked them out with a blow to the head, something he most likely practiced, took out their organs, and left. He kept their faces intact, but never cleared away the blood, and committed these crimes at night, probably at dawn, which explains no witnesses. There's only been one publicly known suspect, but this one was kinda odd and seemed more like a publicity stunt, because on November 30th, 2011, Almost 20 years after the first murder, on the reality show, The House of Secrets, which is a show where contestants are locked away in a house for 10 weeks while each contestant has to conceal a secret that everyone else tries to discover. A 21-year-old man named Joel Gades would implicate his father Jose as the Lisbon Ripper. Police would take it seriously, and before they even arrested him, Jose had already confessed details of the murders to several online publications. And crazily, Portugal could not try him for the Lisbon Ripper murders as those had already lapsed under the statute of limitations. But they could try him for a murder in 2000 they thought might be linked. But upon investigating it, they quickly realized that his details didn't match the real facts of the cases and he was quickly dismissed. But what's really interesting about this one is there are similar murders of sex workers between 1993 and 97 in the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Denmark, and Belgium, which has led to the thought he could be a long-haul trucker. There's even a theory that he was connected to a serial killer 
we discussed back in part six of this series, that of the new Bedford Highway Killer, who was responsible for the murders of 11 women between 1988 and 89. The FBI even flew to Portugal and worked with Portuguese authorities to try and make a connection, as well as Portuguese authorities traveled to New Bedford. The main premise of this theory was due to New Bedford's large Portuguese population, and the theory was that this suspect had left the city at some point and started his crime spree in Europe, maybe because he feared law enforcement was closing in. And yes, because of the crazy statute of limitations law, even if the Lisbon Ripper confessed, he can't be arrested. Although, if they could connect his crimes to other countries, he could be extradited. But it would probably be a long shot, because the canonical three murders in Portugal are the only ones to have hard evidence connecting them. And one last note in theory, all three of these canonical victims were HIV positive. It's possible that the killer was also HIV positive, maybe contracted from a sex worker, or maybe even contracted from one of these victims, which could be his motive for the killings and it would most likely explain why he stopped, as he probably died not long after. In 1998, the people of Euro Honduras would begin to hold an annual festival called Festival de Uvia de Pesis, which translates to Reign of Fish Festival, which sounds exactly like you would think. It revolves around an unexplained phenomenon in which fish just fall from the sky. It happens about four times a year, although the festival occurs with the first major rainfall in May or June. Scientists have long researched this weird anomaly, and they largely chalk it up to strange weather, like strong winds or water spouts, which suck up the fish into the atmosphere, only for them to come raining down. Although, this seems unlikely, due to the improbability that it happens every year at the same time. Furthermore, it's the fact that the nearest source of fish in the Atlantic is about 45 miles away. A less sensational theory suggests that the fish may inhabit underground rivers and are forced onto the streets rather than falling from the sky. The 1970s National Geographic team actually discovered that fish in Euro were completely blind, supporting the idea that they may live in subterranean waterways. But the locals all cite a legend in which Spanish priest Father Jose Manuel de Jesus Saburana, who arrived in Honduras in 1855 and seen how poor the people of Honduras were, and prayed for three days and nights asking God for a miracle to provide the poor with food. And God delivered as many tasty fish fell from the sky. And this has happened every year since. May 19th, 2016. 19-year-old Logan Schindelman would speak to his grandmother on the phone as the two got ready for work. Logan had been raised by his grandmother, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, and had attended Washington State University for a year before coming back home. The young man was like a lot of other young people. He was kind of trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. Unfortunately for his grandmother, he had started smoking marijuana, which she claimed had made him slightly paranoid. She also noted he had became more withdrawn and cut ties with his old friends. He would continue working several odd jobs after returning home. But we go back to that morning in question, May 19th. His grandmother would record, during their phone conversation, Logan was acting nervous, like he was on some type of mission. He would even tell her he had an epiphany. She told him they could continue their conversation after work. But when she got back, he was nowhere to be found so she would track his cell phone and see it pinged near Olympia, which is where his mother lived and he often visited, so she just assumed he was there. But the next day, when he failed to show up, she reported him missing. Unfortunately, the police department was closed for the weekend. Yeah, crazy, huh? But that Monday, she would file a missing persons report, and when she did, she was told his car had actually been impounded the day after she had last seen him, and it had been southbound on the interstate, and his wallet, several bags of food, and cell phone were found in the car. Inside his wallet was his debit card, driver's license, and 25 bucks. But it would get stranger. Witnesses reported seeing him with two other men on the interstate. Then later, one woman reported seeing them standing at the back of his car, which is parked on the shoulder. One of these men had thin blonde hair and a bowl cut. The other 
had shoulder-length blonde hair, but when she came back through that evening, the car was in the same place with the hood lifted and no one present. Later, three witnesses called 911 to report a vehicle matching his was found drifting across lanes with no one visibly inside driving. It hit a concrete divider before stopping. Although it was reported by three witnesses that no one was driving, a truck driver reported seeing a Caucasian man with brown or red hair jumping out of the passenger side of the drifting car and running into the woods. Even weirder, later that day, the sighting of a naked teenager in the area was reported. This person was never identified. Detectives did think it was Logan and brought out dogs but could not pick up a scent. The initial investigation involving searches organized by Logan's uncle and law enforcement focused on a two-mile radius around the location where Logan's car was discovered. The difficult terrain and lack of finding any evidence whatsoever made the whole thing even more confusing. The family would hire a private investigator, but he wasn't able to do much either because there was so little information available. Although, detectives did find out the days before disappearing, he sent a text that read, I hope to survive this week, to a young woman he had met on a dating app, but no one knows for sure if he was just joking or what. Cell phone records would also offer a glimpse into his movements on the morning he disappeared, showing a series of directional changes on the interstate. However, the reasons for these changes and the eventual stopping point is still unknown. The lead detective would state that they had no reason to believe Logan was dead, but also had no reason to believe he was alive, which kind of showed how baffling the whole thing was. There's not much in the way of theories here, but they did interrogate Logan's half-sister's boyfriend early in the investigation due to tensions between them. In fact, Logan's uncle was really suspicious of him and notified police early on. However, he would pass a polygraph and was dismissed. Another theory speculated by many is Logan had an undiagnosed mental illness, which could have led to the uptick in his paranoia. And his family believes that something bad may have happened to him, which they cite the fact that he left his cell phone and wallet behind. But there's just no real indication of foul play. The Mariana Trench is the deepest ocean trench on Earth, and it may be the reason that some conspiracies about it do exist, such as the Mariana Trench Bone Pit. The theory suggests the existence of a massive pile of bones at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, specifically in the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the trench. And allegedly, this bone pit was discovered in 1960 during a bathyscaphe expedition, which is like a self-propelled vehicle used in deep sea dives. Although there's zero proof that this actually exists, there are a few theories. Of course, the first one is that the bones may be remnants of a lost civilization akin to Atlantis, submerged in the Pacific Ocean. The second theory is kind of similar. It states that the bone pit could be a burial ground for a still living underwater civilization. The third theory gets even crazier by suggesting that aliens might be responsible for the bone pit, suggesting that UFOs could be dropping off dead humans or humanoid beings and burying them in the depths. The final theory is the most likely one. The entire story is fabricated for the sole purpose of being put on a conspiracy iceberg. Now we come across one of those so-called fearsome critters the Malamo was a huge crane that was reportedly so large that it could eat snakes the size of car tires, but it was known to live on a diet of giant green worms that lived in giant wormholes. Apparently, one of the more famous tales involved the Malamo trying to catch one of these worms when it pinched one in its beak and tried to pull it out of the hole, but the worm held on and its body stretched like an elastic band. The bird pulled more and more until the worm was really thin and let it go, flying out like an arrow and hitting the bird in the eye. The Malamo lost its grip after being hit and the worm escaped. Of course, the fearsome critter stories came from the early lumberjacks in North America, and while some of them were used to explain weird phenomena they had seen, a lot of them were nothing more than tall tales. July 13th, 1959, Blenheim, New Zealand. A 42-year-old woman named Eileen Moreland 
went out to milk the cows at 5.30 a.m. Her and her husband, who had been married for 19 years, owned a nine-acre farm, which they tended to, so it was not unusual for her to be up at this time, as she took care of the dairy cows as well as holding down a few other jobs, such as a nurse aide, while her husband was a patrolman for a nearby airbase, but this morning would be different, because as she was gathering the milk, she would notice halfway across the paddock a strange green glow coming through some low clouds. She would record that it was two lights like eyes or big lamps. It was so bright that it overwhelmed the small torch she had brought along. Eileen, scared, jumped behind some trees and continued to watch. A circular craft, about 30 feet wide with a curved glass cockpit, slowly began to descend, while two shafts of green light beamed down from its underside and two rows of small orange jets shot outwards like spokes from the rim of a disc. It suddenly stopped and hovered about 15 feet off the ground. The jets disappeared and then reappeared in two rows. The top row spanned clockwise very fast, while the bottom row moved in the opposite direction. She then heard a hum, and inside the curved glass cockpit, she saw two figures wearing silver suits and helmets. They were tight like a wetsuit and looked like they were made of aluminum foil. The men were seated one in front of the other. Both had their backs to her, and a flickering light shone up from below, reflecting off their suits. Then one emerged from the craft and began to walk towards her. She could see his face through a small visor in the helmet. He was wearing a wide belt with a black disc at the center, and a harness on his chest that held a small dial and a series of tubes coming from the helmet. His left hand was missing and encased in a dark sheet. He then began to shout at her in a language she did not recognize, before retreating back to the aircraft. After a moment, it tilted at an angle and shot up into the sky at a great speed and disappeared behind the clouds, making a soft, high-pitched whine. She now stood alone with the scent of pepper in the air, wondering what had just happened. She was relieved the attracting power of the green lights had left, but did not know what to do, so she just went back to milking the cows. But while milking, she felt shaken and puzzled, so she went back indoors to tell her husband. He took it very seriously and called the police, although the official police report records that Eileen told them that her husband thought she was drunk. The commanding officer would visit the farm, and he found Eileen calm and rational, and he actually found a second witness, a local farmer about four miles away, who seen a bright light in the sky about 30 minutes before Eileen had her sighting. This caused the whole thing to become big news in the area, and articles about it would be printed all over the country. But I have to note here, Eileen had only told them about the aircraft. She did not divulge the part about the one-handed man. She kept that to herself at first. But Eileen was not the only one to see lights like these in the skies. Actually, this happened a lot in the 50s in New Zealand. One report claimed to see a craft in the shape of a rolled-up newspaper. Another claimed cigar-shaped, or a flying barrel shape, while some claimed to just see balls of light, either green, red, or orange. The New Zealand Air Force was curious, so they established the Civilian Saucer Investigation to prove or disprove all the claims. It had 350 members, and they logged 700 sightings in just five years, but they wanted to investigate Eileen's sightings specifically and they assigned Lieutenant Charles Jennings to carry out the investigation. He would interview Eileen just 10 days after the sighting and took an audio oscillator machine which could generate different musical tones in an attempt to find out the exact tone of the aircraft's engine. And Eileen still did not mention the one-handed man yet. However, Jennings would record that he believed her account, noting he was convinced she had seen the craft. But Jennings took the more skeptical view and he wondered if it was a top secret aircraft, as he knew about two quote unquote flying saucers the US and Britain were working on, which were hovercraft that could get off the ground only a few feet. So he wondered, did New Zealand have something similar? But it's here that it gets stranger. Eileen had began to develop painful blisters like pimples on the back of her hands, lower lip, and back, and if she scratched them, watery residue came out. Then more would pop up. She also had painful swelling under her left eye and a small patch like a brown mole appeared on her forehead. She did see a doctor at the military base who kept it all confidential. Jennings also had a theory he kept quiet. He was concerned 
that she had been exposed to radiation and actually took a Geiger counter there late one night and stayed up trying to detect anything all the way up to dawn. The symptoms disappeared after six months and it was written off as due to her nervous strain from the encounter. Jennings would then continue his investigation and found three more witnesses who claimed to have seen the green light on that night. One of these was even an Air Force officer who had seen a vivid green sphere lift off the ground. Finally, Eileen would come clean about the man in the silver suit with one hand, and it would be a year and a half after this that Life magazine would show a U.S. test pilot in his silver pressure suit, helmet, and black gloves, which was almost to the T of what Eileen had described. Jennings thought it was important enough that he kept a clipping of the cover in his file, and now he wondered, when Eileen said the man spoke a language she did not understand, could it have been Russian? The file would be marked secret after this, and Eileen was told to keep the information of the man to herself. He was at the height of the Cold War, and now it was a national security issue. However, the wing commander of the local airbase totally ripped Eileen and the investigation, citing that she had an imaginative exaggeration of a normal experience and there was no such visit. He went on to clarify that Venus had been shining through a layer of high clouds or ice crystals, causing her to see something that would not normally be seen. Records did show that Venus appeared very bright and low that night the witnesses claimed to have seen a red light. One astronomer even noted Venus could turn from a dull red to green as it met the horizon, even an emerald green. Everything would be blown off and Eileen was ridiculed. However, in March 1960, she would make another claim, this time seeing distant lights in the skies, but she only spoke to Jennings under absolute discretion because of the ridicule she faced before. The details of this sighting has never been released. However, the New Zealand government remained adamant that no such sightings ever occurred. So it's somewhat strange that a researcher in the 70s requested to see the documents only to be declined by the government, leaving us with no idea of what she had seen the second time. It's also strange that the senior Air Force officers and the Secretary of Defense have tried to paint her as delusional with the air marshal even stating she was emotionally unstable. They've also claimed they can't show the documents because they agreed to Eileen that they would not show anyone. However, that was only with the 1960 sighting. They still wouldn't release all the information from the first reporting as late as 1983. Citing the reasoning is that the defense force would be overwhelmed with requests from eccentric hobbyists and the more extreme believers in visitors from outer space. The majority of files would eventually be released in 2010 after multiple official information act requests, but some of the files will not be released until 2070. Jennings, for his part, would tell his family and friends that he stuck by his belief that Eileen had really seen something, along with the other witnesses, but due to him signing a non-disclosure agreement, he couldn't talk about it. Eileen would die at 99 in 2016 and would never talk about what happened, so we're left to question. Just what did Eileen see? Was it alien? Was it perhaps a Russian craft that landed there mistakenly? Or was Eileen really delusional as the New Zealand government declared? I'd love to know what you think in the comment section below. In 2001, a woman named Mary Lateo become concerned when finding something odd with her two-year-old son. It seems she noticed he had developed these sores under his lips and had also began to complain about bugs. Mary became concerned like any mom and began to examine the sores with her son's toy microscope only to discover red, blue, black, and white fibers coming out. She would of course take him to the doctor to be checked for allergies or potentially something worse, but they found nothing abnormal. In fact, one doctor would write to a referring physician that Mary needed psychiatric evaluation and was worried about her use of her son. But Mary didn't stop. She would try to schedule an appointment with an infectious disease specialist who would also not see her after reviewing her records, and he would suggest that Mary had Munchausen syndrome, a condition in which a parent pretends the child is sick to get attention, and this would basically continue for every doctor she met. But Mary contended that her son continued to develop more sores and more fibers poked out of them, she and her husband felt their son had something unknown, and Mary would choose the name Morgellons disease 
after she found a description of an illness in an old medical history essay from 1690 where Sir Thomas Brown, an English author, wrote something called Morgellons, describing a case where children broke out with harsh hairs on their back. Mary would then start a foundation in 2002 that become non-profit in 2004 to raise awareness for an illness she said was poorly understood. She initially hoped to receive help from scientists or physicians, but instead, thousands of others contacted her and claimed to have also experienced the same sores and fibers, as well as neurological symptoms, fatigue, muscle and joint pain, and other symptoms. In total, more than 12,000 families had contacted the foundation. They would start a campaign to have people send their letters to the CDC, which formed a task force to look for the so-called disease. A year later, they would begin doing skin biopsies from the people affected to try and determine a source of the fibers and threads. They found that 59% of the people tested had some kind of cognitive defect, which is difficult to say if that come pre morgellons or not, while 50% of the people tested had drugs in their system, and 78% had been exposed to solvents, which is of course a skin irritant. The study detected no parasites or anything like that. Instead, it mostly came from cotton that the individual was wearing. While this has been written off by the medical community and basically society as a whole, the so-called disease did take a hold online where a small group of individuals would do their own self-diagnosis and claim they had it. They would then do more research and conclude it was somehow related to Lyme disease, which led to further theories like it came from biological warfare, nanotechnology, chemtrails, or even aliens. The affected individuals have often attacked doctors online who doubt the condition, which has just further led the medical community to not want to study it. However, it's mostly understood now as a form of delusional parasitosis, which is a mental disorder where an individual has a persistent belief that they are infested with living or non-living things such as parasites or bugs. The Mekong River that runs through China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam is the 12th longest river in the world and third longest in Asia. And at this river is where our next mystery lies because it is subject to a weird phenomenon that very little is known about. The Naga Fireballs, or Mekong Lights, are seen annually in late October. And it's these glowing balls of light that naturally rise from the water into the air. They are reddish and about the size of a small sparkle up to the size of eggs or basketballs, depending on the source. They quickly rise up to around six to 700 feet before disappearing. The number varies on a given night, but can be anywhere from 10 to thousands of them and are spotted on a 160 mile section of river, although they have been reported in smaller rivers and lakes in the area. The locals attribute the sightings to a giant serpent said to live in the river, and supposedly the sightings go back for hundreds of years. As far as theories go, one documentary in 2002 showed soldiers firing tracers in the air during the festival, and this has led skeptics to believe that the crowd on the other side of the river, about a half a mile away, would not hear the gunshot for 2.5 seconds after they were fired. So they would see the light first, then cheer and drown out the gunshot before it reached them. A similar theory proposed that the fireballs are caused from the firing of flare guns, or that it's being caused by some kind of man-made trick like air lanterns. Regardless, it said the reason is for tourism. Others, of course, chalk it up to swamp gas. December 24th, 1890, Christmas festivities were in a full swing at the farm of a man named Tom Lurch, who lived in South Bend, Indiana. A lot of his friends, including a local reverend, had attended. Outside, the snow would stop falling and clouds drifted away to reveal a beautiful snow being lit by the moon. Tom's sons, Oliver, 20 years old, and Jim, 23 years old, were giving their attention to a young lady that was attending the party. When Oliver's mother would ask him to go fetch some water from the well, he would throw on a coat and grab two buckets and head on out. And about five minutes later, this joyous holiday party would turn into a nightmare because outside, Oliver began to scream. Tom and the others would all rush outside, only to find the cries were coming from up above. 
As Oliver screamed, Help! Help! It's got me! The scream seemed to be moving around from up above, but no one could see him. Soon the cries stopped altogether, and an eerie silence fell over the concerned family. Neighbors were called in, and began to search every roof in the area and through local fields. Then around 10 p.m., Oliver started pleading for help again, where eight or nine people reported hearing it, but they could not see him. The search would continue, and something stranger was found. Oliver's footprints found just 225 feet from the house, about halfway to the well. One of the two buckets still sat there. There was no sign of a struggle, and his footprints just stopped. The search continued all throughout Christmas Day, but no clues were found. South Bend police records indicated a high number of witnesses, which gave the strange disappearance credibility. So what happened to Oliver? He was too big for an eagle to carry off, so that was ruled out. Some suggested he was killed by another party guest, who was jealous he had been talking to a young lady at the party. And then this person was able to use ventriloquism to project a voice up into the sky. But that seemed just as unlikely, and it doesn't explain why a body wasn't found. While another clue, who claimed Oliver said, they've got me, not it's got me. But who was this they? But this story sounds, well, dubious. So where did it come from? It was actually from Fate Magazine in 1950 a magazine that focuses on the paranormal, which already makes it seem kind of less believable. The writer was a man named Joseph Rosenberger, and he didn't list any source for the article. However, this wasn't its first appearance. It can be traced even further back to 1906 in the Honolulu Star Advisor, a newspaper that had a section that documented several strange disappearances. The story is basically the same, except in the newer version, Oliver is giving a brother and a girl that he is chatting to. And the biggest difference is the story happens in 1889 rather than 1890. Finally, there is no records of a Tom Lurch or a Oliver Lurch or even a Lurch farm that existed in South Bend. Nor is there any records of this incident. This one, I'm not sure why it's on here, since it's technically not a mystery. Interesting story though. August 24th, 1998. New Orleans, Louisiana, we come across a strange unidentified persons case that has plagued investigators for years. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of details, but we do know that the woman was found under a house, and the circumstances of that discovery have never been shared, but all her remains were intact. The coroner estimated she had died some two to four weeks prior, yet he could not find a cause. He also estimated she was between 25 and 35. Now, was she buried? or wrapped, or just laid out, that's all unknown. Just like it's unsure if anyone was even living in the home at the time. She was about five foot two, and may have medium to light complexion with dark brown or black hair and brown eyes. But a forensic sketch was made based on what is thought she might look like. She would later be known as the Orleans Parish Jane Doe, and that's pretty much it. So little info is available. Did a ghost ship haunt the Straits of Malacca sometime in the late 1940s? That's what the mystery of the Orang Madan takes a look at. The word Orang is Indonesian for man or person, whereas Madan is the largest city on the Dickensian island of Sumatra, given the name basically as Man of Madan. The first appearances of the story was a series of three articles in a Dutch-Indonesian newspaper on February 3rd, February 28th, and March 13th in 1948. According to the story, sometime around June 1947, two American vessels navigating through the Straits of Malacca, ships named the City of Baltimore and the Silver Star, among other ships, picked up several distress messages from a nearby Dutch merchant ship known as the Orang Madan. A radio operator would send the following Morse code, SOS, from Orang Madan, we float. All officers, including the captain, dead, in the chart room and on the bridge. Probably Ho of crew dead. Then, there would be a few incoherent dots and dashes before the final message stated, I die. After this, the ship was never heard from again. The Silver Star crew eventually located the ship and boarded it to find the undamaged Orang Madan. On board, they found a ship littered with corpses, including the dog. The bodies were sprawled out on their backs. Their frozen faces were looking up at the sun with their mouth wide open and eyes staring straight ahead. No survivors were found, 
and no visible signs of injury could be found. They prepared to tow a ship to a nearby port where a fire broke out in the cargo hold, forcing the party to abandon the ship. The Orang Madan then blew up before sinking. So, what happened? There's basically just a few theories on this one. First, there's been a lot of speculation that the ship was smuggling chemical substances such as a combination of potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin, or even nerve agents. According to the theory, seawater entered the ship's hold, reacting with the cargo to release toxic gases which caused the crew to succumb to asphyxia or poisoning. Later, the seawater reacted with the nitroglycerin, causing the explosion. If it was nerve gas, it's speculated that the U.S. had paid someone to smuggle it out of China where the Japanese military had been using it because they would not leave a paper trail. That would explain why the Orang Madan was not found registered anywhere. Another thought was that an undetected smoldering fire, or some kind of malfunction, caused carbon monoxide to leak, which killed everyone on board, and then the fire slowly spread out. However, the biggest theory is that it never happened at all, with several skeptics pointing out that there's no mention of the case in Lloyd's shipping register, and Dutch records could not find any ship by that name, but again, if it was smuggling something in a secret operation for the U.S., it wouldn't be registered. Furthermore, the Silver Star, which was said to try the rescue attempt, did exist, but its logs did not show anything of a rescue, leaving many to believe the dates, location, names of the ships, and even the story is exaggerated or never happened to begin with. In fact, the first article never even names the ship that found the Orang Madan, while the second and third article tells the story of a sole survivor who was found by an Italian missionary who was on the Marshall Islands. Before dying, he supposedly told of a badly stowed cargo of sulfuric acid which caused the crew to perish from poisonous fumes. He claimed it was leaving an unnamed port in China to Costa Rica and was avoiding authorities. The survivor, an unnamed German, died after telling his story. After this, the newspaper would claim this was the last part of the story as they had no more data. However, new evidence would show that the story actually went further back to 1940, but there were again many differences with this version, one being totally different SOS messages, meaning the whole thing is likely a tall tale. You know what they say, for every layer there's a defecator, this time in Terrytown, New York, when in 2013, someone began taking dumps on Riverwalk Park benches along Pearson Park between late November and early December, where it stopped for a while and then continued, no less than seven times. He or she has still not been identified. October 21st, 1993, around 7.30 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in LA. A man named Paul Deering checked into the hotel where he gave his address as being in Salt Lake City, Utah. He would then be given a key and set the checkout date as the next day. But when that checkout time arrived, Paul had still not left. So they went to his room, only to find Paul with the deceased by his own hand after ingesting cyanide. Authorities would do what they do and began to look for the next of kin. But when they reached out to the residence of Paul Deering, they would be shocked to find out that Paul Deering was alive and well. So the man in the hotel had stolen his identity. We started a whole new mystery, and one that hasn't been solved in the three decades since. The imposter, or John Doe, wore a wedding band and had keys to a BMW and was around 30 to 45 years old. Besides that, there was nothing that would point to a real identity. Fingerprints were taken, but they've never matched anything on record, and there's not much on this one, so we'll go to theories. The first one is that the John Doe was just really depressed, leading to him taking his own life possibly from a divorce since he continued to wear the wedding band. Maybe it reminded him of happier times, but the real mystery is, who was he and why did he steal the identity? It's possible that he knew the real Paul Deering in passing and simply took the identity. Many unidentified suicide victims use aliases or steal someone's ID, so it's not unusual. And that brings us to the end of part 20 of the Unsolved Mega Mystery Iceberg Explained. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.